So I'm here to talk to you about coroutines and uh, the whole language, the, specifically about coroutines and systems programming. And by systems programming, I mean code that heavily interacts with an operating system, specifically Linux. Um, so I'm the maintainer of Flannel, um, and I also work on Rocket, which is our container runtime, which is um, similar to Docker, and it, it has to interact quite a bit with the underlying uh, operating system primitives. So it's, uh, so we use Go for that, but and Go is a, is a good language, uh, but one thing I want to touch on in this talk is whether or not it's a good language for doing this kind of work. And we'll see that some, I want to go, go over some challenges that we've, we've faced when dealing with Go and this type of program. Okay, so what are Go routines? I'm sure anyone who's, who's done Go programming knows what Go routines are, but uh, I'll go over it real quick. It's uh, lightweight threads on top of operating system threads. So sometimes the lightweight threads are known as real threads, user level threads, but it's basically um, a, a thread, which is an execution context in a stack, uh, but it's something that's implemented in a user space, and then they're multiplex, so they're, they're scheduled on top of real operating system threads. And usually there's, there are way more operating system level threads than the, than the lightweight threads. And the reason you want to use lightweight threads is because they're you know, fast to, to switch, the context switches are a lot cheaper. And especially if you're doing a lot of I.O., um, then they're really good because they don't really, only if physical operating system threads can be scheduled onto different processors, but if you're I.O. bound in your block, then it doesn't really matter. Um, and you can use things like equal or select or whatever the KQ or whatever your operating system provides to kind of do this magic of um, multiplexing multiple threads that are blocked on I.O. onto few real operating systems. Uh, so Go came from Google. Google writes a lot of web servers, and if you're writing web servers, Go I think is a terrific language. Uh, it's it's very easy to create these Go routines. Uh, you're creating usually creating a Go routine per request that's coming in. So for that type of stuff, it's very very nice. Um, so the Go runtime schedules them on operating systems, like I said. But there are problems. First problem when you when you uh, deal with Go and systems programming is that there is no fork. Now, fork is a fundamental system call of the Unix operating system. You take a process, you fork, you get a parent-child relationship. The the, the the child is basically an exact copy of of the parent, basically. So now Go does not expose it in any of the APIs. In the high-level APIs, the, the syscall package is low-level. Um, uh, low-level package for the, for exposing basically every system call, but fork is not there. And the reason they don't expose it is that fork does not work well with multi-threading. And since Go is fundamentally multi-threaded, when you start up a Go process, even if it does, even if it's not launching any Go routines, you've got multiple threads running. Over. So this is what the Linux manual main page for fork says: that the child process created with a single thread, a single thread. The, the one that calls fork. It means if you have a bunch of uh, a bunch of thread, and one of them calls fork, that thread is going to get forked off, and everyone else in the child process is going to get killed off. And uh, this is, can be a problem because the entire virtual space of the parent is replicated, including the status of mutant mute conditional variables and other stuff. So why is this a problem? Well, let's take a look. So we have a library. It, it has a function foo. And it's going to you know, take a mutex. And it's going to do something that's going to unlock the mutex. And then we have a thread one. It's going to come along. It's going to pull foo. And then uh, thread two Thread two is going to fork. And in the child, it's going to pull foo. So let's see what happens. And why is it a problem? OK, so uh, that lock in the, in the corner is the state of the mutex. The mutex. So initially, Mutex is unlocked. The first thing that happens is thread one, lock, uh, thread one runs, takes the lock, executes this instruction, and takes the lock. Next up, thread two runs and forks off. Now, here it executed the port command. So a child process gets created. 
child class is going to have only one thread. That's going to be the thread that's called the port. And as you see, it since it made a complete copy of the uh, of the user space uh, of the virtual uh, virtual address space, the child is also going to have a locked matrix. So then, thread one is going to call uh, a mutex lock, and we have a deadlock because the, the mutex there is nothing to unlock the mutex. This thread was has, is not running in the child process, so nothing is going to unlock this thread. And uh, so the, ch the child is just going to sit there and wait for the lock. And I will never, never succeed. Um, in practice, who can be anything? And it can malloc, for example, the underlying, um, the underlying routine that you do allocates memory has a bunch of locks. So even if you're doing something as a kind of mundane as allocating some memory, this can give you. Uh, this can be a big problem in the multi-threaded slash port slash multi cross environment. So this is why Go forbids fork. Okay, so, but why do we fork? So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So if you're just doing fork exec, where you're forking a process and you're executing a different, uh, different executable, something you do when you're you know, in a bash where you're saying, running this program forks and then I can the execs. It's not a problem. Uh, for that, there are two kind of calls that uh, Go provides. Exec command is the high level API, um, and OS start process is the, the more heavy low level API that allows you to do this fork exec pattern. So if you're just trying to do a very simple fork exec, there's no problem. Okay, so where, where else would we fork? Um, sometimes you want to force for, for parallelism. So you want to launch multiple processes because you want to you want to schedule you want to schedule or you want the operating system to schedule schedule them onto multiple processors. So for that, that's actually not a big deal. You just say go funk, you, you you spin up a whole bunch of pull routines, and then there's this go max prox. Uh, I think it's exposed environment variable. Is environment variable is through the through function call where you can. <coughs> we can tell Go how many processors it can basically eat up, and it'll distribute the, the Go routines onto the onto those OS threads and onto the processors. So that's not a problem. However, here is a function, I, I, no, a fun, fictional function called safe untar, although that actually came from out of rocket code. Basically. So we needed to untar a, um, a tarball, and we had a function untar written in Go, takes a tar file, blows it up onto disk. But the problem is when you're untarring a file, it, you can kind of start at the root, but uh, you can point it at a, at a, at a root. But because of, the sim because of the sim links, it can kind of escape out of the working directory where you started it from. And so you can kind of, well, you, you think you're untarring it into this directory, but in reality, you it can be screwing up you know, your slash root or something, or slash dev. So we wanted to protect that, and one way to protect it is to uh, put it, the function into a true jail. And true, not collective code. Uh, so this would be kind of an ideal way to, to do it. You fork, and then in the child, you do the true operating uh, system call, and then you invoke the, the hard function. So, and by the time it was done, uh, I mean, you would have to wait pit and stuff, but this would be a way to to execute the untar function in a separate process that's been through uh, jail to a particular directory. But we don't have more. So that's one one use. So another use is suppose you are doing um, writing a upstart or system D or even bash, and you want to do that fork exec where you're launching a command, but Maybe you before you before the fork and, and after the fork but in the new process, but before you actually execute the new the new executable, maybe you want to change some uh, operating system uh, attributes. For example, you might, might want to move it to the C group. Uh, system D, basically, the, if you're familiar with System D, when it launches processes inside a service, it, it allocates a C group for them, so that. Uh, you, you can impose constraints on, the, on that C group. It's nice for cleanup. It's nice for um, kind of grouping things in the hierarchy, uh, seeing the hierarchy. 
Or you might want to do the set R limit, which uh, changes the U limit, uh, the number of open process, uh, open file descriptors, or something that you're allowed to, that the process is going to be allowed to, uh, to have. So if you if you want to do something like this, and this is something that a systems, you know, this is the system what I what I call kind of the systems programming. You're interacting very closely with an operating system. This is, again, something that's very difficult to do uh, if you don't have four. Uh, but before I go, so for this kind of stuff, there are actually workarounds that people have invented. I didn't really put them here because, in my view, they're so ugly that I don't want to <laughs> talk about it. Uh, <laughs> if you're familiar with C and set jump, long jump, they somewhat reminiscent of that. Um, Okay. So the second issue that we ran into is that there are certain syscalls, certain operating system calls that you make that are actually that act on a thread, not a process. So uh, an example is unshare and set and s. Those have to do with namespaces. That's the thing that makes Docker provide you isolation. That's kind of the what usually makes containers container. Uh, Contain is that they able to spin up these um, namespaces, which are able to isolate a certain portion of the operating system namespaces. Uh, set priority is basically the the call that exposes the nice command. You have a CMD from the nicer process, and then you that the call set priority. Uh, these when you make these calls, they don't change the whole. Uh, the they don't change the whole process, they just change the, the thread. And part of that, part of the reason they, that happens is because Linux really doesn't have threads underneath. Linux only has these things called lightweight processes. And threads are somewhat emulated on top of it. Um, so to Linux, a thread is basically a process. So when you make these Linux specific calls, it's acting on what it knows as, as the process, even though to the program, it's really a thread. So why is this a problem? Okay, so we have a, um, we want to run a function, we want to run a go routine, and we want to change the, before we run the actual user code, we want to change the priority. So in this case, we want to lower the priority, the, like the default priority is 40, uh, 20 or something. Um, and we want to lower it to 5. So, oh no, sorry, it goes, the set priority goes from 0 to 40. Um, so we call set priority, and then after we load the priority with go routine, we go ahead and execute the work. Except that this is a direct system call to the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel knows nothing about go routines because go routine is a user level construct. It's a goal construct. So what it's actually doing is changing the, uh, the priority of the thread that is this go routine happens to be running on. So the go runtime has a scheduler that is taking these go routines and scheduling somewhat randomly onto this physical operating system thread. So wherever operating system thread this, this go routine happened to run on at the time is where you're changing priority systems. Of course, it might, three lines down, move your go routine from this operating system thread to a different thread that you haven't changed the priority. So now, midway through your function, you will end up actually running in a different priority. Not something you want to do. So how can we fix it? Okay, so the problem. Go routine may move to a uh, different operating system thread. Here's one potential solution. There is a, in the runtime package, there is this lovely function called lockOS thread. And lockOS thread will uh, the, slides, but, uh, the lockOS thread will lock this go routine to this thread. And Vice versa, this thread, the operating system thread, will only ever run this operating, this go routine. So it creates a one-to-one -one mapping between a go routine and a thread, which is kind of nice. This is our way to get of getting operating system threads back. Kind of. we now have a one-to-one -one mapping. So if we do that, we can set the, we can lock this, we can pin this go routine to the operating system thread, and then we can uh, set the priority. 
and then um, and then going away, and we can be sure that while this go routine is executing, it's not going to migrate to a different thread. Sounds good. Um, and oh, by the way, we have to uh, when we, we are done, we can unlock it. Uh, but there's still a problem. When this go routine exits, uh, the thread is still going to be there. The operating system thread is still there, going to be there in the thread pool. So now another random go routine is going to get scheduled onto this uh, physical operating thread, and it's going to be run at a priority that's you know much lower than kind of the default that you want it to run. So some random go routine is going to be you know, chugging along the priority and maybe spending a lot of time figuring out why. Okay, so let's see if you can fix that. Um, well, we can say, no, 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 it's all right. We'll just add another deferred call. Before we get out of the go routine, we are going to restore our priority back to zero, which is as be zero, should be 20 as the default. But um, that seems to, that will, that will almost solve the problem, right? We lock the thread, we set the priority, and we are done, we clean up. Release, reset the priority back and uh, undo the undo the pin. Problem. The problem is that while the go this function promises that the lock was thread promises that no other go routine is going to run on that thread, the scheduler may still run on that thread. So when that scheduler decides that it needs to spin up more operating system threads because of whatever reason, maybe it's low, you know, there's, there's some ratio then it's it's uh, just crossed some watermark and it's still. It might decide to launch those threads on the on the thread that's executing those this go routine. So and since the the, the launch thread, the spawn thread, is going to inherit the priority of its parent, some random thread is now also going to be running a priority file. Not not what you want. Okay, solution. Well, sort. There's not really no solution, but so you still want to use runtime blockers thread, and then you want to explicitly when you start every core routine, you want to list out or set every attribute that your whole program might have changed. That will basically help, except that there are certain things that are not possible to undo. So that unshare call, it unshares the. It like forks off the, for example, hit namespace, and there's no way to, to go back easily and, and reset it to what it was. So it was like it's kind of like true, right? If you true into, there is no way to, to get out of the truth. Well, I think there are, but no, no same no same methods. So even that's not possible. It may not work. Um, so conclusion, uh, I think that as a systems developer, I really think the go routines were not the right primitive for a language that's trying to become a new systems level language. I mean, that's fine for the, if you're trying to compete with Node.js for writing um, web services, but if you're trying to be a, a system language, I don't think that's the right thing. Um, they impose too much runtime, too much magic. Uh, developer like me that you know, does a lot of systems programming, we want to have a very, very Thin runtime, we want to have direct control over the operating system primitives. Um, I think doing a lightweight approach, a, a lightweight threading as a library with a, a syntactic support in the language to, you know, so it looks nice. I don't know what it would look like, but you know, for us, that's some ideas. Um, is would be would be very nice. Um, it, it should be fairly easy to opt in into green threads, into lightweight threads, uh, because the, for the most part, they provide provide a, a lot of value, and I think the industry more and more people are kind of moving away from the operating system thread. But basically, not having a way to opt out, and we've seen through, we've seen, we have looked at a couple of ways to try to opt out, and it's really not easy to opt out of this mechanism. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's a disservice to some degree to the, to a certain, certain subset of the community. Um, so that's all I got. Um, questions. Uh, Look at the blog. We're hiring for accomplished careers. There is Blake, he's the intruder. Yes. Can you go back three slides? Three slides, sure. 
So um, how can the scheduler run on that thread um, when it's locked? Because the lock says that no other Go routine can run on this thread. Gotcha. The scheduler is not a Go routine. The scheduler gotcha. is part of the runtime. Gotcha. It almost seems like it would just be a, um, you know, it's a library issue that, or that they need to fix. Yes, uh, one way, uh, yeah, you can say that actually the, the problem is that this runtime lock with thread, its semantics are not good enough, right? Um, so that would solve this problem. It would still want to solve, solve the, uh, the fork problem. Um, so fork doesn't exist on every operating system, right? I mean, it's like the problem with Go is they try to make a runtime for every OS. Uh, so yes and no, because there is. I mean, like, it's like you mentioned that. Threads are implemented using lightweight processes. The only difference between the process and the thread is memory sharing. Right. In theory. Yeah. So. I agree that. Um, I agree that fork is not an every operating system, but it's not why Go doesn't have it. Because if you look in the syscall package, no, I, I, I get there is there's a whole bunch of things that are not that are Linux specific or FreeBSD is specific. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, but also as a systems language, I if I am writing a something that's very Specific to Linux, I don't want to. Uh, I don't need cross port. So, are you dropping down the C? Um, no, we use uh, different hacks. <laughs> 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 we we haven't dropped the C, although that comes up a lot. I'm just going to call it the C. But actually, the problem with C, if thing is, if you're running, if you're dropping to C, there are different sets of problems. Mm -hmm. Because when you drop to C, it actually creates a new thread. Uh, or it has to schedule it onto a separate thread because it's, it doesn't, it can't multiplex it because it doesn't have the visibility into I/O. So, and then there are other performance implications. So, uh, going in and out of C and Go is actually not super fast. One of the problems. I mean, overall. I'm oh, sorry. Another question. I'm just curious, any response from the Go team on some of these issues? Or? Uh, we on these issues. Well, the fork is a well known. Um, and I think the I don't know what the, the official stance is, but it's more or less, yeah, they're not going to have it. Um, and uh, for a good reason, because four and multi threading don't, don't work very well. So, unless they make these very dramatic changes, I don't think how, I don't know how they can do it. Uh, on this particular one, we haven't uh, contacted, any, contacted them yet. Uh, we might. Uh, I think that the. See, again, this, I don't know if you're abusing or not, but the, the quintessential example of why you would need LogOS thread was something like OpenGL. If you're doing OpenGL and there's thread-specific data that's stored in a thread context, um, you know, it's for that. And for that, I think it works. But there are other uses when, when it doesn't. So I don't know. We might, I might contact Brad or Rock, or Rock Scott or something. If you could get a dedicated pool of threads that were just for your uses, and then you can mess with them as much as you like, and you need the schedule to schedule them whenever you use them, that'd be a yeah, workaround. That would be, that would be much better. Because for a lot of the stuff that we do, um, we don't even need that many go routines. Sometimes not. Um, and even if we do, we're not launching a thousand. We can actually, we are launching two or three go routines. We know what each one of them kind of is doing, so it can be, it's a lot easier for us to keep track of them. 